give folks a couple more minutes to get their audio on and enter from the waiting room and work out the tech kinks. If you're here for a webinar with NDIA, not NTIA, and on the Digital Equity Act and the NOFO, then you are in the right place. Give folks just another minute or two and then we'll get started. For those of you that are already here and connected and can hear me, please put your, um, your organization's affiliation with your name and your pronouns, add those to your name. You can also feel free to introduce yourself in the chat as some other folks have already done. Laura's here, hi Laura. Okay, um, I think we'll still have folks trickle in, but we have a lot of content to get through and so we're gonna get started. So I am Amy Huffman, I'm the policy director for NDIA and I'm so excited that you're here with us today. Um, our wonderful team, most of them are here as well. And before we get started, I don't wanna forget that big, big thanks to many of them, Sion, Angela, Pamela, Yvette and Josh for helping put this presentation together. We do have a lot of content, so um, just bear with me. Feel free to ask questions throughout in the chat, and if they if our team members can get to them, they will. But also, we will have time for Q and A in the end. So if you if it's a bigger question, hold it for the end, and we'll talk about it at the end. And again, if you are just joining us and um, you haven't already put your your affiliation, your organization affiliation, and pronouns in your name, please do that. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. Give me one second. All right, folks. Um, nope, that's not the view I want. Okay, so again, if you're here for an a webinar on the BEAD and Digital Equity Act NOFOs, you're in the right place. Um, I do just want to start off by introducing ourselves for those of you who might not know us um, and let you know that um, uh, a couple of things up top about that we'll go through. So NDIA, we got started about eight years ago um, by our wonderful executive director, Angela Seifer, who you might see here on the screen. Um, and we now, today have over 700 affiliates in 48 states and territories, including the District of Columbia. Our affiliates are folks that uh, teach people how to use computers, teach people how to find affordable broadband offers, um, help people find affordable computers, or offer of digital navigation services, or anything above and in between those things across the country. Um, they're small mom and pop shops, community-based organizations, and sometimes uh, scale, uh, scaled up to state and local governments as well. Um, but we are here first and foremost as a community for those folks, as practitioners across the country. And we also represent folks, um, these affiliates, uh, in their needs to DC and the federal government to make sure that your voice is represented in the policy things that happen. And today we're going to talk about the Digital Equity Act, which your voice had a big part in making sure happen. Um, we also uh, do practitioner support. So we have web this type of thing or webinars and trainings for you all to help relay uh, congressional speak to real people terms to make sure everybody understands what's going on. Um, we do a lot of awareness around digital equity and what that means, and then also some data and research. So today we are gonna talk about the Digital Equity Act, NOFO, 
or notice of funding opportunity is what that stands for. Apologies when I slip back into acronyms, someone please feel free to call me on it. And then also the BEAD NOFO, which is the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment NOFO. I wanna be very clear that if you are applying for these funds, please don't only attend this webinar. Please also attend all of the National Telecommunication and Information Administration's webinars where they will give you much better and detailed understanding of what you need to do to apply. Um, these, what This webinar today is more of an informational webinar. Make sure our community understands what, what, what is it, are in these NOFOs and what's not in them. And we are particularly taking a, and, and particularly for the bead portion of the presentation today, um, that the bead NOFO is a beast. And so we will not get through all of it, but we will go through the highlights and, and what we think particularly will um, impact you all and particularly the digital equity work that you all are doing. So just want to give that caveat up front. And then another note for anyone who's just interested in these things writ large, do know that um, NTI is hosting a lot of webinars and technical assistance events and that those are open to everyone. And so encourage you to also attend those um, as they are the ones who wrote these and are the real experts. We're just taking what we learned from them and trying to process them and, and work with you all to understand them all as well. Okay, so that's my big disclaimer. So today we're gonna mostly talk about the Digital Equity Act and which we're super excited about to finally see um, this notice of funding come and open up. So just a quick reminder that the Digital Equity Act is split into two programs, um, the State Digital Equity Capacity Grant Program and then the Competitive Grant Program. And it's about an even split, but not quite. The State Digital Equity Capacity Grant Program has a bit more funds. Um, and the state digital equity capacity grant program goes through states. Um, it's essentially a block grant to states and it's split into two grants, the planning grants and then the capacity grants. The planning grants are 60 million and the capacity grants are 1.44 billion, as you can see here. So for a total of $1.5 billion that will be going through states or to and through states um, to support digital equity. So um, in terms of who's eligible to receive, oh, one quick thing I do want to remind people of, the notice of funding opportunity that was released on May 13th for the Digital Equity Act only um, is around the state planning grant program. So far, there's not even been a, what they call a request for comments or basically the public comment period on what should be in the guidelines for the state capacity grant program or the competitive grant program. So today we are, if it sounds like we're skipping over some things, that's because we are, we don't know we'll be in the guidance from NTIA on the, on the capacity grant program or the competitive grant program. And just remember NTIA is the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. They are a department within the department, the US Department of Commerce, and they are the administering entity for all of for the grant programs that we're going to talk about today. All right, so who's eligible? States. And it's the 50 states, District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. And surprise, also tribal organizations, and this can be Indian tribes, Alaska Native entities, or and Native Hawaiian organizations, and US territories. So that's the United States, Virgin Islands, Guam, American Samoa and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. And if someone's from there, please pronounce or <laughs> fix my pronunciation. Um, and just so you all know, in terms of um, the requirements and uh, the, the general guidelines that are set forth in the NOFO, the 50 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico are treated the same. And then tribal organizations in US territories have um, different obligations and different requirements for the planning process. Um, but I'm going to refer to all of them as an eligible entities just to shorten things and make it sweet and simple. So what's an administering entity? So an administering entity is the, um, the organization or the agency that's selected by the governor or an equivalent official if it's a different official in a different in a state. Um, and they will administer the state digital equity capacity grant program for the life of the program. So that is both the planning grant and the capacity grants, which the capacity grants are basically the implementation grants. 
the administering entity is responsible for receiving and administering the funds, developing, implementing, and overseeing the state digital equity plan, and making subgrants to anyone who's going to help support the plan for its implementation uh, and its implementation. Um, we governors will in their um, uh, applications will select the administering entity. And um, once NTIA has that list, they will pu publish it publicly. Um, at this point, we don't know who all will be the administering entities for states, um, but we expect that for most states that it will be their broadband office. The eligible uses of the planning grant dollars are ba basically what they sound like. They're to create the plan, right? So this is to develop the state digital equity plan. And they can use, uh, they can also subgrant, states can also subgrant these, um, uh, these funds out to eligible entities to help support the planning process. The NOFO has a fuller list of eligible entities that can help support states and or um, in, eligible entities in, in the planning process. Territories and possessions, um, which is a strange word, it's in the NOFO, don't, don't, don't blame us, we didn't come up with it. <laughs> Um, they uh, they can use the plan develop uh, the planning funds for an actual plan development um, and related activities, and then tribal organizations they can determine whether what they would like to create their own digital equity plans or use their funds to participate in whatever state their tribal organization resides in in that statewide digital equity planning process. So, how much money are you gonna get? Well, um, so for States, DC, and Puerto Rico, there are um, in the NOFO, uh, page 13. Maybe don't go there right now because we want you to pay attention, but <laughs> promise we'll drop a link in the chat and you can go look and see how much your state or, or if you're in DC or Puerto Rico will get. Um, it's a formula based, uh, there it's ba the tentative amounts are based on a formula um, that Congress came up with and had in the act. Um, and we, when we looked at the ranges of grants uh, are from 460,000 to 4 million. For tribal organizations, NTI set aside $15 million and then that amount will be uh, divided equally amongst the organizations that apply between, and will be somewhere between 50,000 and 150,000 depending on the number of applicants. So we won't really know how much tribal entities will get until after we see the full number of applicants. And then um, for territories, there's $3 million uh, uh, set aside for them to total. Tentatively, there's $150,000 each for the planning for the territories. Um, and for the state digital equity capacity or planning grant program, there's no match required. So states uh, or territories and tribal organizations do not have to present a match in order to qualify for the program. So what's in a plan. So first, here's a bit of a timeline so that everyone can see. So we know that the act passed in uh, November 15th. Um, in February of 2022, we and a bunch of other organizations and probably many of you submitted a, uh, comments to NTIA to develop these uh, guidelines. The notice of funding opportunities were released May 13th. Um, three days before they were supposed to, uh, statutorily, at least for the BEAD program. Um, for the uh, planning grants, states have, or the eligible applicants have until um, July 12th to submit their applications. Um, it's a bit different, again, for tribal organizations and um, uh, territories, they'll submit a letter of intent by uh, July 12th. By September 29th, um, NTIA expects to begin uh, giving out the funds um, to uh, administering entities. And so, which means because states have a year to create their plans, it'll be fall of 2023 that the plans will then be due to NTIA. And then those plans, remember, are um, required to participate in the capacity grant program. And what we learned with the release of the NOFOs is that NTI expects those grants to open up in spring 2024, and then they expect the competitive grant applications to open up in fall 2024. So within the act and within the NOFO, there's this term called covered population, and it's basically marginalized communities, people who have really experienced the digital divide in um, 
really extreme ways. And so it's organizations who live or individuals who live in covered households, which covered households or um, low income households. And then this whole um, list of different types of populations like veterans and, um, and ethnic minorities and et cetera. And basically the reason that I'm bringing this to the front now is just that as we talk about what's required to be in a plan, just remember that Congress's intent and NTIA's intent in the NOFO is for the administering entities or the eligible um, entities to uh, create their digital equity plans with an eye for in prior prioritizing these covered populations and addressing the digital divide writ large for each one of these covered populations. And on top of that, they're required to, um, to address each of these, not just a handful. It has to be each of these covered populations. So in a plan, they're required to have a clear description of the state's vision for digital equity in the context of its overarching strategy and goals. And there's statutory requirements, so requirements that Congress set out, and then there's a few additional requirements that NTA um, laid out in its NOFO. Um, so the statutory requirements I'm gonna go through quickly because they are in the law and um, easy to find. Um, but first it's to identify the barriers to digital equity that these covered populations face. And then it's basically to create objectives for um, understanding those needs for the covered populations in terms of their access to availability and affordability of broadband, um, digital literacy, et cetera. And then after they identify those populations, where they are, and their distinct needs in terms of uh, digital equity, um, then they have to create an assessment and measure, measurable objectives for closing the digital divide for those covered populations, and then also have to figure out how those goals and objectives will interact with the different types of plans or goals that the state may have in different arenas, like economic development, their health outcomes, um, civic and social engagement, et cetera. So for instance, if a state already has an economic development plan, how are their goals that they're creating within this plan going to interact with that economic development plan? Um, the measurable objectives um, are the uh, Congress intended for the, uh, the, the administering entities to collaborate heavily with other organizations, not only to implement and achieve their measurable objectives, but also to, to, to define them and determine what those are. And so their intent, um, so Congress listed out a number of different types of organizations that they would like uh, the administering entities to collaborate with and take um, and work with in the planning process in the stakeholder engagement process. And these are, some of them, and, and also on this next slide, you'll see. Um, and then they're required to then document who those organizations are, who they did stakeholder and outreach engagement with, and then how they um, intend to collaborate with them in the, um, not only the development of the plan, but the implementation of the plan. They also, um, NTIA added a few other stakeholder engagement requirements um, and listed out that, uh, administering entities must use a variety of communications media to talk to people, about, to, to notify or, uh, residents and organizations about the planning process, uh, including but not limited to using online, online mechanisms, uh, newspaper, print, radio, TV, etc. Um, they also must provide any information about the planning process uh, in appropriate languages for the demographics in those regions. They have, it really does require significant collaboration with certain stakeholders, which we'll go through. In addition to the ones we just went through, they, they list out a few more. And it encourages collaboration with these, uh, these populations, so covered populations, just like we just talked about. Um, they call out that not only should uh, administering entities collaborate with the organizations that represent the co covered populations, but actually the actual people who have these direct lived experiences of being disconnected. And quickly, I just love to shout out to you all in our community that um, this addition to the NOFO actually came from you all. This was a recommendation that came from our working group 
um, when we were creating our comments to submit to NTI and NTI included this in their NOFA, which is a big win for our community. Um, and then the also NTI is uh, encouraging collaboration with these other types of organizations and at a, at a minimum, they say uh, including but not limited to. So of course, administering entities can work with a number of other organizations to create the plan. Um, additional requirements for the plan, they would like states to create a vision statement. What does digital equity look like in your state, in your territory, in your, in your tribal region? And then to figure out, okay, well then now that we have this vision, what are our needs? What Do an assessment of what those needs are. Um, and then also an asset inventory. So what do we already have? What are the assets throughout our communities that um, can help, we can leverage to help close this digital divide? And so think of that as a human asset inventory, not an inventory necessarily the pipes and wires that many are accustomed to doing, but like, Who's teaching digital skills? Where are your digital navigators? Do you have any digital navigators? It'll be that type of asset inventory that'll be required. The plan will have to have a coordination outreach strategy embedded in it, um, a description of how the state uh, or administering entity will include um, the digital inclusion plans that have been uh, created throughout their areas. So we know, and NDIA knows that many organ or many municipalities and regions across the country have already created digital inclusion plans, um, the administering entity will be required to um, figure out or to, to report how they intend to include those goals in their statewide strategy. And then they're also required to have a holistic implementation strategy. So now that they've created these goals, what does implementation look like? And they're required to, to map that out and lay that out for NTIA. And then an explanation of how that implementation strategy addresses the existing gaps and then the barriers for the covered populations. It sounds simple, but an implementation strategy actually wasn't in the legislation. So it's really important that state that administering entities lay this out. And then um, administering entities will also have to um, provide a description of how the state will accomplish the implementation strategy and by engaging with partners such as workforce agencies, CBOs, labor organizations, higher ed, et cetera, a timeline for implementation, and then also how the state will coordinate DEA, BEAD, and other federal or private digital equity funding. All right, that was a lot. Take a deep breath. And now we're gonna talk about BEAD, otherwise known as Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program. So this was that $42.5 billion program that Congress allocated to, it's intended really to get service across the country um, to places where there's not already service. It's, so it's a deployment program. Um, and it's also similar to the Digital Equity Act. It is block grants to states. Um, and then underneath that, it'll, states will then use those funds and uh, develop competitive subgrant programs. The amounts that uh, states will get, um, and in this instance, in BEAD, the eligible entities are the 50 states, the District of Columbia, and the territories you see listed here. So the amount that the eligible entities will get um, is based on a formula, and that allocation is based on the percent of unserved or unserved locations in the in the eligible entities area, and um, the program requirements will require a 25% match that will be incumbent on either the state to provide, the subgrantees to provide, or some combination of thereof. This program really prioritizes fast, so fast networks, networks that are built at a minimum of 100 megabits download, 20 megabits upload, but really is, in, but is fiber forward, meaning it's fiber there's a fi heavy fiber preference, uh, unless that can't be um, completed for whatever reason. It also really prioritizes affordability and then universal access. So we'll talk about that in a minute, what that means, but those are the main priorities of this program. One thing that's really explicit 
in the bead NOFO and actually the Digital Equity Act NOFO as well that we didn't cover there because we're covering it here. We didn't want to you know, bore you by saying the same thing twice. Um, is that NTIA, and this wasn't something that was this explicit in the act itself, but is very explicit in the NOFOs, is that NTIA is really encouraging and nearly actually requiring uh, the eligible entities to link their BEAD and Digital Equity Act plans. What this means is that um, those two plans should really be sequenced, be working in tandem, and be complementing each other to achieve digital equity writ large for the eligible entities area, the state, territory, or tribal area. Um, so in the NOFO, there's this quote that an eligible entity cannot have a five-year action plan that does not address digital equity. We're going to talk more in a minute about what the BEAD planning process is, but for right now, I'll just say that it's a, called a five-year action plan. And so NTA lays out these steps that step states uh, or eligible entities should take in order to make sure that these plans are really linked. So first, that they should ensure continuity between the staff developing both plans. So if there's a planning team developing the digital equity plan and there's a planning team developing the bead plans, that there's someone that's on both of these teams so that they can bring the voice of each of these planning processes to the other one. Um, that there's, they also encourage uh, eligible entities to create overlap between the planning teams. So not only just making sure there's one, but there's multiple of these people. Um, and then also that there's a formal and direct communication and collaboration between those two teams. This becomes really important in any state or territory or area where um, perhaps the bead planning is happening in a different department than the Digital Equity Act planning. Because having um, this formal and direct communication and collaboration pathway set up will ensure that these plans actually complement each other. So the bead process is complicated. Um, again, we're not gonna be able to walk through all this and nor should we, um, but we'll give you kind of a snapshot of what this is gonna look like. Um, so first the notice of funding opportunity came out again on May 13th. Right now, um, eligible entities are in the process of submitting their letters of intent. And um, they have to do that, I believe, by, it's either July 12th or July 18th, it's somewhere in July. 34 of them have already done so, at, and that was as of last week. I expect actually it's more at this point um, because it really is just a letter. Like it's, it's a very quick letter. And those letters of intent um, also identify who is that uh, state or territories um, administering entity for the BEAD program. So if you're curious who that organization is in your state, uh, you can go to NTI's website in their um, press release information and you can see the states that have submitted their letters of intent and then you can probably find who the administering entity for the BEAD program is in your state. Um, once that letter of intent is uh, submitted, it unlocks uh, some planning funds for the state, 5 million per state. Each state and territory will get a minimum allocation from the B program of 100 million, and then some will get less, some will get more based on other things. Once the planning funds are allocated, the state then begins its five year action plan process, and then they submit an initial proposal. Um, then 20% of the funds are allocated, then they submit a final proposal later on. And then once they submit that final proposal later on, and we're talking by later on, I mean a couple of years from now, um, once they submit, submit that, then the remaining funds are allocated. So this is what the timeline looks like. This is directly from NTIA's um, one pager on this. So, so uh, yes, the letter of intent is due the 18th of July. Um, after they receive those $5 million in planning funds, they have 270 days to create that five-year plan. Then there's initial uh, proposal, et cetera. Um, one thing that uh, this, these plans and the, allocate, and the allocations of funds to the, the administering entities really hinges on is um, new maps that FCC, the FCC is in the process of creating. And once those ma maps are created, there will be a better understanding of the unserved and underserved areas um, and then that is actually what will determine how much each 
eligible entity gets to invest in their bead program in their state. All right, so what are some eligible uses of bead? So the first thing to know is there's actually a prioritization of how uh, the eligible entities are encouraged to spend their funds. So first they have to spend the funds to cover on all the unserved areas in their, all the remaining unserved areas in their, um, their area. And in the context of bead, unserved means less than 25 megabits download, three megabits upload. And then once they've served all the unserved areas, then they can serve uh, the underserved areas and underserved in the context of bead means um, equal to or greater than 25 megabits download, three megabits upload or, and less than 120. So, so if an area, you know, your household has like 75 down, 10 up, then that would be considered an underserved area. But if you have a connection of 10 down, one up, that's an unserved area. So you're gonna be prioritized as the first location the states are gonna be required to serve. So once they serve under unserved, then underserved, then uh, they are encouraged to connect the remaining community anchor institutions in their state that don't already have um, gigabit service um, uh, down and up. Once the community anchor institutions are covered, then they can use remaining funds for other uses, including digital equity and broadband adoption. They are again encouraged to prioritize fiber, um, and subgrantees are required to participate in ACP. So, say that a state has um, has served all the the served and the unserved and their community anchor institutions. What are some other things that they can use funds on? Well, cybersecurity training, uh, remote learning or telehealth services, digital literacy, upskilling, computer science, coding and cybersecurity, education programs, implementing their uh, digital equity plans. Um, it's not meant to supplant that, but just to, to complement that, the funds from the digital equity program. Uh, sign up assistance for programs like ACP, um, multilingual outreach, prisoner education on digital literacy, et cetera, digital navigators, um, direct subsidies. Again, not meant to supplant ACP, but to uh, complement it or the affordable connectivity program. And then any costs associated with stakeholder engagement, et cetera. So there's quite a few things that states and territories can use their bead funds on in terms of digital equity. All right, so we've talked a little bit about, remember, BEAD is block grants to states, then state, states, well, states, territories, DC, they will then subgrant out those funds. Well, who can they subgrant out those funds to? So um, it's people who will, um, uh, or, or excuse me, not people, organizations who will get service to the unserved. So it could be cooperatives, so telephone member cooperative, cooperatives or electric membership cooperatives, um, nonprofit organizations, public-private partnerships, private companies, so internet service providers, that, you know, traditional internet service providers, public or private utilities, public utility districts, and even local governments. So these are all the different types of organizations that can be subgrant, subgranted to deploy networks. Um, they do have to meet specific criteria, um, and those are all laid out in the NOFO. We will not get into those here. Um, but just know that they have specific things that they have to meet in order to even be an eligible subgrantee. Um, and they also have, um, there will be program requirements that uh, states will use to determine, uh, you know, this application or this application, right? There'll be weights and, and, and points and that sort of thing. Um, one thing that we want to make sure you all were aware of is that the bead funds can also be used to service multi-tenant buildings that are considered unserved um, or underserved. Um, and in the context of these buildings, um, unserved will mean that they have less than 100 megabits download, 20 megabits upload. Um, these can be in uh, low-income urban areas. And so uh, for you all, we will make sure that you're aware that these are eligible locations. Um, the thing that might cause a couple of things that might 
cause your state or territory to have challenges in getting to these places is the mapping. So uh, one thing you can do is to help map these areas, figure out who has service in them and who doesn't. Um, and then another thing is just an awareness that there's these uh, multi-tenant dwelling units that may not have service or may not have adequate service. And so if you're aware of these places in your communities, we, uh, we highly recommend that you work with your local um, administering entity to make them aware of them so that they can include them in the planning process. All right, so let's talk a bit about affordability because affordability is a big component of BEAD. Um, so there are some requirements that the NOFO lays out, a middle-class affordability plan, a low-cost broadband service option. Um, there's no definition that's provided for either of these things by NTIA, but they do give some examples. Grantees are uh, required to submit their grantees, so the eligible entities will be the ones who will be creating these definitions that are unique to their state or territory, um, and they will be required to, to submit those proposed definitions to NTIA in their final proposal, and then NTIA will either approve or you know, disapprove those, um, so they'll be the ones creating them. Um, and then one thing to note is that, again, I think I said this already, but subgrantees are required to participate in ACP. So the, the ones delivering the service are required to participate in ACP. So a little bit more on that middle class affordability plan, because that's a new thing, a new term that we hadn't heard of until the NOFO. It's that eligible entities must include in their initial and final proposals a middle class affordability plan. Um, and this is to make sure that the internet's affordable for all middle class families um, that uh, receive or are in the service area of a bead funded network. So the guidelines again are vague, um, but they give again some, some examples. So one thing that uh, eligible entities can do is they can require bead funded pro uh, providers or those sub grantees to offer low cost high speed plans for all middle class households. Um, or they could provide consumer subsidies to households that maybe aren't eligible for ACP, but um, the cost of broadband is, is outside their reach. Um, or they could use their state regulatory authority to promote structural competition, but they leave this open for the uh, eligible entities to define. And the same is true for the low-cost broadband service option. They again leave this open for the eligible entities to define. But eligible entities are required to offer at least one low or the sub grantees are offered to require at least one low cost broadband service option. Again, the eligible entities will make that definition and they'll submit that definition in the proposal to NTIA. Um, and however, NTIA, well, NTIA hasn't defined what that low cost broadband service option is, they have said who's eligible. So any household that qualifies for ACP will be eligible or if they happen to satisfy any additional criteria that that eligible entity sets out, then they would also be eligible. But so, so in your area, any ACP uh, household would be eligible for uh, these low cost broadband service options that are required under BEAD. Um, so they give uh, some things that are required that these definitions have, and then some things that are encouraged. So for instance, um, it's required um, that there's good download speeds. It's encouraged that those plans reach at least 100 megabits. It's required that there's good upload speeds, but it's encouraged that they reach at least 20. So you see where this is going. Um, NTA, again, didn't set out a definition, but gave states a bit of a, like, a roadmap of where to go. All right, so bead planning, and we're kind of going to go through this a bit quickly because um, we are getting close to time and I wanna leave time for questions. Bead, uh, the, B, the five year B plan. So once states have that 5 million, they can use it for any of these um, activities, data collection, mapping, budgeting, et cetera. Staffing, that's an important thing to know. Your state or territory can use the planning funds to staff their offices. It's important. They don't have enough staff. I can go ahead and tell you that right now. Um, the five-year action plans, there's a long list of requirements that have to be in these. Once they receive those initial planning funds, they have 270 days to complete them, and they have to include all these things. Um, there's like three 
of these slides. So I'll just kind of jump to the high points. They have to um, provide details um, on who that program office or the eligible entity will be, including their staffing, et cetera. They have to identify obstacles to reaching their BEAD goals and then how they intend to address those goal, those obstacles. Um, they also have in this section have to have an asset inventory um, and identify activities and partners. Um, they have to describe what their engagement process will be and many other things um, in this, in this five-year action plan. They, the BEAD plans, similar to the Digital Equity Act plans, um, and this is another slight change from the act itself. The act itself, the stakeholder outreach and engagement for the BEAD plans wasn't as robust as it is it was in the Digital Equity Act. However, because now these plans are linked, remember, NTIA has said basically in, for those creating the BEAD plans, you're, you have the same requirements of engaging your local communities, of engaging stakeholders, and making sure that the plans work for them and that their voice is heard in the planning process as you do under the Digital Equity Act plans. And so there's a full like longer list of who's included, um, who must states include in this planning process, like no, there's no option there, um, pages 53 through 54. Um, and this is just a summary of that. And then there's also a list of um, organizations that they encourage states and, and, and um, administering entities to involve in, and that's list, this list here, which you'll see is also very similar to the list of, uh, of organizations and residents that are encouraged and required in the Digital Equity Act. Um, and just a note on the stakeholder engagement, the same types of outreach and engagement methods that um, are encouraged and required under the Digital Equity Act. So public meetings, um, engagement through social media and all types of languages and all of that that is encouraged under the Digital Equity Act, that's also encouraged under the BEAD process as well. And with that, I'm going to pause. I'm gonna pass it over to Angela to just give us a couple bits of wisdom on what it means to lobby versus what advocacy is versus education. And then we'll start our Q&A. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> um, in, in the NDIA world, it's common for us to hear, oh, we can't tell the state what to do because that would be lobbying. Um, if it's not legislation, it's not lobbying. And this legislation has already passed. Your state might still come up with legislation on their own. So I'm not here to give you advice on what exactly is lobbying and what exactly not is lobbying, but I can say in a broad scheme of things, um, if you're telling an office, like a broadband office, what you think they should do with money based on legislation that's already passed, that's not lobbying. You're educating, right? You're explaining to them what you do. You want them to know what you do. You want them, that's their stakeholder engagement, right? They have to ask you those questions actually. Um, so I encourage you, you don't have to wait to tell those broadband offices, those administering entities, what you think um, or how they could even go about stakeholder engagement. Because remember, their first job is stakeholder engagement. So if you have suggestions on how they should go about stakeholder engagement, that's not lobbying. You're giving them advice, you're suggesting, you're educating. Um, that all is perfectly legal. Um, if you, if it turns out that your state is coming up with their own legislation on how this money should be used, then you're going to have to dig into what the rules are around lobbying. So I'm putting a link in the chat. This is a website NDIA uses, uh, Boulder Advocacy. It's amazing. They have an FAQ that answers so many questions that you might have. So I highly encourage you to check it out, um, even beyond this current issue of how to engage in, in these particular monies, um, but to have your voice be heard in a way that is legal, right? Um, everybody wants that. Their website has lots of information on that. Back to you, Amy. Thank you, Angela. Okay, actually, Angela, since you've been monitoring the chat a bit, are there any questions that were asked in the chat that I haven't answered yet? Actually, no, I think they have been answered. Um, some of them are uh, more on the deployment side. Actually, quite a bit of the conversation has been more on the deployment side. Um, so again, we encourage everyone to watch those NTIA webinars and ask questions in those NTIA webinars. 
Um, does anyone else have questions about the materials just shared with you? There's conversation in the chat, which is great. We love the conversation, but so far uh, not seeing questions for you. So, and we did um, have a, you know, this is an, um, an open meeting. So please feel free to raise your hand. Oh, I see Cindy's hand is raised. Cindy. Yeah, I was clapping, not asking. Um, Amy, <laughs> did you say that um, the, the digital inclusion come, funding comes after everyone is connected, the un and underserved? Is there like, that's a priority and then Yes, in bead okay. alone. Yes, in okay. the bead alone, um, it, the priority is unserved, then underserved, then community anchor institutions that don't already have gigabit uh, speeds, and then digital equity or an inclusion um, projects. Um, in the Digital Equity Act, that's not the case at all, right? So just in bead. Okay. And, and to clarify, that's how they have to prioritize it when they're writing their plan. But once the plan is written, if they're like, well, it's going to cost us this money, much for unserved and this much for underserved and this much for community anchor institutions, no, look, we have some left over. We're going to spend it on digital equity. The, the, the NOVO is very clear. They don't have to wait to spend that money on digital equity. As long as they know they're going to have that money because they've laid out a plan, they can go ahead and get started on this. We don't know which states will end up in that situation, but we are pretty confident some of them will. Um, so that's that's why, right, you all know we don't focus on deployment, we focus on the skills, the affordability, the devices, and that we've included BEAD in our overall because the affordability piece of BEAD, but also that multi-tenant, and there will end up being some states are going to use some of that BEAD money for digital equity. Thank you. All right, Ron? Um, yeah, I'm assuming that the state broadband offices will be uh, influencing some of the major uh, decisions uh, in how money gets um, spent. Here in uh, Michigan, I'm in Ann Arbor, uh, there has not yet been a single hire uh, for our office. And in light of the fact that we've seen with cases like Agit Pie at the FCC that uh, agencies can be a re revolving door for people from the incumbents. Uh, what can uh, people in Michigan do if our state office only hires Comcast people? So I would actually, so, so I am aware that your state is hiring now, right? Uh, I, have, I did talk to the folks that are standing up the office. So encourage you to actually send them. Actually, actually I applied for the director position. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I encourage you to send them send them candidates. Uh, I don't I don't know that once people are hired, there's much of a recourse other than to educate them right on on uh, the organizations across your state who are doing the good work. Um, but yeah, I definitely encourage and this goes for any of you. Um, most of the um, I do expect that most of the broadband offices will be uh, in charge of both the bead and the digital equity act programs. And so, uh, and many of them are hiring. And so please send them people that are, uh, have digital equity experience. Uh, they're all, they're all very busy work working. The one, the, the ones I know, is anybody else from Michigan on this call? Mm, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure there is. You, I'm sure there is. Okay. Yes, I'm sure in the chat. Um, Anne Thies has a question. I'll read it out to you, Amy. For nonprofits that will want to participate in these projects, what is the best path forward to be included in these plans? Wait for the state to release plans and funding requests, or can nonprofits actually apply at this point? So nonprofits cannot actually apply at this point, but the the our encouragement is certainly not to wait until the plans are out. Um, are definitely get involved in the planning process now. Again, we don't know quite yet who uh, will be the administering entity for the Digital Equity Act in your states. That information is coming, but we expect it's a broadband office. So if one of our um, staff, our team members could put in the chat the link to the um, Broadband USA page where you can find your state broadband office, we encourage you to go ahead and reach out to them. Tell them who you are, what you do, where, what type of work is it, uh, it that you do to close the digital divide in your community, 
and um, and then start that conversation and and just let them know you you're there to partner, to support, to help, and collaborate and be part of the planning process. And, and so that's that's why we want you all to understand this whole process because it's not time you won't see any money 2023 20, 2024 20, it's going to nobody should hold their breath <laughs> right it's, it's going to be some time but what you can do is get engaged with that broadband office be helpful to them if you think about a broadband office and maybe doesn't have any digital equity support they could use some advice right so be somebody that they can turn to and then get engaged in that planning process because how the money gets spent will be based upon the plan so that's why we are so much encouraging you to influence the plan in your state. So Don, I see a question from Donna about boilerplate language for grant proposals. No, we don't have that. Um, it will be a while before organizations could apply for individual grants. Um, I think we'll be providing writ large support, although I don't know if boilerplate language would be something we, we provide or not. Um, Curtis's uh, comment is that the 42.5 billion may not be enough to connect all unserved and underserved addresses. I don't know, but I, you might be right. Um, Lazone, the capital projects funds um, are actually the first tranche of projects will be announced soon, I believe, from the um, but states are still in the process of submitting their grant plans for that. They actually have until this fall to finish submitting those grant plans. Um, and so once they finish submitting the grant plans, they'll receive the, those funds pretty quickly. Um, and yes, those funds would become available before both the Digital Equity Act and the BEAD funds because they were meant to be pandemic recovery. Let's see if there's any more questions. This is Steve. Um, okay, so there are two, yes, uh, Maggie, great question. So for the Digital Equity Act states, Puerto Rico and DC are required to submit an application. And in the application, I, I encourage you to read the NOFO for what's required, but it's a short narrative amongst other things. Um, for the, um, for tribal organizations and territories other than Puerto Rico, it's a letter of intent, but for states in DC, it's a application. Um, and the letter of intent is, it, it is a separate process than the letter of intent for bead. Um, Donna, I don't think that's true. She says that we are told if we are too much part of estate planning, we would be in conflict to then apply for funding. Um, the only organization that is not allowed to apply for funding, um, uh, for the uh, competitive awards is the administering entity of the state capacity grant program. So if you participate in the planning process with your state as a, as, as a stakeholder and then apply to the state for grant funds or apply to the federal government for competitive funds, that is, you, there's no conflict there. Um, yes, yeah, cybersecurity planning is required in the bead, uh, the bead uh, plans. Um, okay, any other questions anyone wants to raise? Amy, Dean is asking, uh, we've heard that some offices are unresponsive. Are you all finding this too? Um, okay, so just to like kind of level set a bit, I imagine that there are some real offices that are unresponsive. Um, many broad of the broadband offices are, it may, might be one person or two people. And then as you heard, like Michigan doesn't have an office yet. So um, there, there are several states that don't have an office and there are many states who are understaffed. And so I'm not surprised that they're unresponsive. That said, um, we're happy if, uh, if you're an affiliate of ours to, to provide an introduction if we can. Um, so please follow up with us afterwards for our affiliates. Um, so Jerry's question is a great question. Um, so, the, the, the 
answer in terms of Digital Equity Act is that those funds would start to roll out probably around 2024. Um, so that is a complementary solution to the waiting for the fiber. Um, we encourage though, this is why uh, the Digital Equity Act funds are a great down payment on achieving digital equity, but will not be enough. And so we definitely encourage uh, community foundations, local organizations, private businesses, et cetera, to begin investing in this now. Um, Will there be a webinar for the middle mile funds? I don't know. <laughs> uh, to be honest, there was so much content just from these two NOFOs that we did not think we should fit, try to fit in and squeeze in the middle mile NOFO during this. Um, uh, it, it doesn't pertain to all of our affiliates, so we're not sure, but we'll definitely provide as much information on it as we can. Um, and again, remember that NTI will have uh, 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 webinars on things like the middle mile NOFO, et cetera. All right, so we're at two minutes. I want to again, thank you all for being here and spending an hour of your afternoon with us. Um, please continue to send us any questions, any thoughts that you have. Super again, big thanks to our team for helping put this together um, and uh, really appreciate you all. And uh, we will continue to keep you as informed as we possibly can. The slides will be made available online in case you're asking. And uh, I think that's it. All right, thanks y'all.